When was the last time you took a leap of faith trusting that everything is going to work out? Do you crave growth or are you merely content with the status quo? If you want more out of your life, out of your career, and out of your relationships, you are in the right place. Take the leap and discover how to create a life by design rather than living it by default. Real success starts with you. Now here's your host, Colleen Biggs. All right, everyone. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Take the Leap. I am your host, Colleen Biggs. And you know, week to week, um, every once in a while, we get this like surprise, amazing guest. That's who I have today. For those of you who know Karen Kamba, I just love her. I met her several years ago at a networking event, and I really just looked up to her like I was intellectually stimulated by her. There was so much about her that I loved and I wanted to get to know her more. So I remember we had a phone call and we talked a little bit, but then recently the two of us have really started chatting more and more. And um, she is a mental health advocate for children and mental health, as we all know, is on the rise with issues uh, that individuals are having. It's not being talked about. I believe it needs to be talked about. That's why we're bringing it to today's show um, because it's it's other people are spiraling out um, and I'm I am so deep into reading her book right now and every morning I pop out of bed and can't wait to sit down and read it and I told her it's the hardest book I've ever read so we're gonna get to why it's a hard book to read why she is a mental health advocate for children um, and I know she is for adults as well. So um, before we get to that, I do want to thank the sponsor of today's show at uh, Realty One with Paige Morlino. Choose excellence in real estate with Paige Morlino, a seasoned seven-year AZ realtor at Realty One. Grounded in core values of honesty, transparent communication, meticulous detail, and unwavering commitment, she brings true value to every home journey. As a full-time and full-service agent with a vast network, Paige leverages diverse avenues and masterful marketing, ensuring each property and client receives the attention they deserve for a successful and rewarding real estate experience. Elevate your real estate venture with Paige today. Instantly check your home's value on the link that we've provided below. And thank you, Paige, for being today's sponsor of Take the Leap. All right, let's jump in with my good friend, Karen. It's always fun when you get to interview a good friend. It, it really just makes it better. So she's not only a best-selling author of the memoir, The Snipers We Couldn't See. She's also an international speaker, a mental health advocate for children, She's on the board of a nonprofit organization for the people on the team building programs for mental health solutions for children's parents and teachers. She's the member of NAMI, co-authored a book, Guerrilla Education. She's also Breaking the Silence, Volume 2, which is coming out the fall of 2024. And I mean, she has a list of uh, of things that she has accomplished in her lifetime. But I have to say, Karen, writing this book has to be the number one thing you've accomplished in the lifetime. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. And taking the leap, that's just exactly, I should have put that on the title of my book because that's exactly <laughs> what it is. But thank you for having me today. You know, I don't know if you knew, uh, you didn't know as a child that this was going to be your path that you were going down. When did it become apparent to you that you needed to step up to lead in that advocacy role? Well, you know, Colleen, as a child, it started when I was four with my mom's schizophrenia. And people, as they read my story, they'll find out the what you go through when a parent has schizophrenia or any kind of mental illness and you're the child in that home. Um, you go through your whole life knowing something's wrong, but what they don't realize what's happening to the child is life's getting sucked out of them. The the thriving, the living, what mm -hmm. your normal is, is not their normal. And I always speak for the child with no voice because their, their days are not like your days. And so to get to that, your question is, you know, I went through my whole life questioning myself you lose all self-esteem. You really don't know what life is. You're just trying to deal day, day to day of getting through it. So people think that when my mother committed suicide when I was 29, that that was, oh, you're fine. You're healed up and here we go. And it absolutely was not. 
Mm-hmm. The ch- child does not get any help at home. If you're not going to, if they're not going to get any help, this carries through their whole life and it will never go away. So it constantly changes the whole spectrum of the life. So when someone asked me, when did you know? It was years and years. It's probably when I was 50 years old already. Mm -hmm. And I thought it kept haunting me. We can't be the only family. We can't, I can't be the only child that grew up like that. And nobody's saying anything about that child that's quietly in that classroom and is getting D's and F's and nobody's understanding that they're not stupid. They're just, even though they're called stupid every day of their life, they're not stupid and they're not thriving. And it just kept haunting me and haunting me and haunting me. What haunted me is once my mother died, it started in my brain and it didn't leave me. So then at 50, I thought, good Lord, I've got Mm -hmm. to do it. And I felt like I was chosen. Then I knew if it's not going to leave me, I've got to do something about it. And I just break, dug my feet in and started in and love and logic. Jim uh, Fay is one of the, that wrote my forward. I said, Jim, how do I get started? He said, you sit down with a cup of coffee, like you're sitting with me and you tell that story and you get busy helping them kids because they need mm-hmm. you. And that's yeah. how I knew it actually lived in me for 30 years. It just went late. So I knew. Yeah. I had- and, and if you read this book, like I have, so I am to the part in the book where you are a high schooler. So you are driving now, you have a little bit more independence, a little bit more freedom, but every single day and in every episode that happens, you're scared to death of your mom being revealed, your mom being revealed to others, others knowing about your mom. And when you were a young child and you would have to go to the hospitals and the institutions that she was in, because back then it was shock therapy, you said, Um, and you said there were other people you know, in these institutions. So if you think about it, those individuals that were in this institution probably had a family as well, right? So they were going through the same problems. And back then it didn't feel like there was much therapy (laughs) for patients as there is today. No, you know, they changed it in the 60s where Mm. uh, uh, President Kennedy said, now we don't want everybody locked up in asylums, insane asylums. We want to kind of let them loose And um, if you will, and the sad thing is there's some people that need, you know, to be an institution to save themselves as well. It's not just to protect others, it's to protect themselves from others. But I will tell you that as a teenager, like you were saying, where you're at in my book, you, you don't want a different parent, but you actually, so you go through different emotions of hating your parent, Mm -hmm. you're the children are resilient, Colleen. And if I would have had someone explain to me what was going on with my mother, I might've looked at her differently. But when you don't have any of that help, which I know is still going on to these days because yeah. people aren't reaching out to the, they cannot avoid the men. If there's mental, you know, there's one in every four families that have struggled with mental illness in their home. Your mm-hmm. next question is say, how many of them have children? So that's where I say, you know, take a real good look at your neighbor. You know, it's not so sad to be a friend Mm -hmm. and maybe ask that kid for ice cream. You know, I will tell you as a teenager, as a child growing up with my mother, I didn't want another mother. I was fearful of her. The child don't want to be removed from the home. The child's trying to figure out what is my home. And why don't you take me for ice cream or take me to a movie or let my day be somewhat like your day. And, um, but because of all this, you know, the sex got it started early. The child wants love so much people need to understand yeah. it's very a, a human being wants loved yeah if you're not getting it that child will starve for it the child will go into uh subject themselves uh as i did as early as the age is 10 13 that you allow sexual abuse to yourself because you're just wanting that hug you're still not getting satisfied from it you know you're going you're just trying to figure out why why uh it's, there's no love there for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just felt, and I still do reading this book. So I'm, the book is called the snipers we couldn't see by Karen Kamba. Highly going to recommend that everyone go out and buy that book. And I'm assuming they can get that on your website. Is that the easiest way for them to get that? Or should we give them an Amazon link or? Oh yes. They can go on my website, which is, you know, www.karencomba.com. And on my website, it has clicks. It's got Barnes and Noble tattered, 
attached okay. whatever way they want. They click on the button. It takes them right to the site. Okay. So karencomba.com. I'll make sure we have the link for the book on there because I'm going to highly recommend that everyone buys that book. Um, but you know, you had a lot of fear and the fear really came from, you know, not only the fear of other people finding out about your mom, but the fear of your dad dying because you would feel lost. Your dad was everything. He was kind of your safety and he was the driver. And without him, you would be left with your mom, which scared you a yes, lot. It was. And you have, to, so people understand I was getting beat every day almost. And then you're called, um, I'll say it nicely because we're on air that you're dumb nicely, but that's not exactly how it was. Well, she called you a dumbbell a lot. Yes, that was did. the word. Every and I day. thought I haven't heard dumbbell in a long time. That was definitely a sixties and seventies word, you know, back in the sixties, obviously yeah. that was when you were going through this and she called you a dumbbell from the time that you can remember the first yep. time you were ever hit by her. Yeah. It yeah. started when I was four or five years old and, uh, it never stopped. And then the only thing that stopped was, um, and when I was an adult and out of the home, um, the stairs and everything, we didn't just start becoming, I started studying schizophrenia. So we started to become, I started trying to understand her. And then okay. right when I tried to understand her, she killed herself. So that's we, a key. I think we should go back to that yeah. for as a mental health advocate. I would imagine that a key is that the individual needs to study to understand what's happening. So you have children that are in homes that are there's mental illness within the home. Yes. Um, and do we, are you the advocate for the children that are in the homes that have mental illness within the homes? Yes. And that's where I'm going with that. Yeah. Colleen, and how you. young, I mean, obviously you were four because you grew up, your mother had this the entire time. Um, and you don't know when it started or, you know, um, obviously it started, I'm sure when she was, young at some point. Did, was there any mental health um, or any mental illness that that was, and I didn't hear it, I didn't read it in the book, that existed in her home with her mom and no. dad or uncles or anybody? There was an uncle, great. You know, some people try to connect it. I'm not so sure that um, I'm, I'm going in that direction. I kind of go more in the direction of one out of every four people suffer from mental illness. Yeah some some form but that's where i'm really yeah. gearing my life is to get into programs and solutions for the child at home I try i'd love to get into the child reach the child and when they're like 10 yeah in, or, or i'd love sooner but um if we can get at least 10 to start explaining to them what's going on in their home so mm -hmm. that they can uh, adjust and thrive and be able to survive it and, and know who they want to be in this world because we're missing out on mm -hmm. these children, people do not understand when they until they get they get to really thinking about it. The thousands and tens of thousands of emails I've reached out, they have said how many of them I survived it. I'm on this side, Colleen, but there's some that end up homeless and mm. into alcohol and drug abuse because they never thought they were worth anything on this earth. So the millions of people before me that that during me that will come after me if we don't do something is we're missing out on the next big waitress, the truck driver, the telephone guy. It doesn't matter what they want to be in this world or banker. We're missing out on them because they get out of high school and they're lost. They give up. Yeah. They they're just totally, don't, they don't have anything because they, they don't feel lived. worthy to a dream. Well, they I, never got talked to about you're going to go to college or yeah. you're going to go here. You're going to do this. What do you want to do with your life? It's they're they're beating down the minute they walk into that house and shut that door. It's a different life. What was interesting to me was until like because I'm at where when you're in high school now, so I haven't finished the book. But what's interesting to me is you didn't realize what moms acted like until you actually had a friend and went to the friend's house and then saw the interaction between the mom and the child, and you were like. That is what a mom is like. Yeah, I actually, didn't know. I didn't know. I actually lied to this bus driver and I was little and I lied and I lied to my girlfriend. I said, my mom said I could come over to your house and play. 
And I needed out of my home so bad. I wanted to see what their home was because I wanted to see it. I thought, okay, what do you do with your, when your mom hits you across the room? When, when you get called damn, damn dumbbell, when, when you get called stupid and get yourself yanked across your, I, what do you do? So I lied about it all. And I was only like seven mm -hmm. and I get over to her house and her mom, it's like, I walked into, you know, Andy Griffith, Cleaver, you know, leave it to Beaver. You know, I thought, <laughs> my Lord, look at this. And, and then of course, reality hit and, and I realized that I was in a different place. And mm -hmm. so I, there was no one talking to the child. And I still think that is today because everybody just thinks that little kid's surviving. You just think that little kid, okay, mom's got schizophrenia or dad's got it or the guardian. And everybody just kind of assumes that little child's just growing up normal and they're not. Yeah. And, you know, that's why I tell teachers that I talk to now that bring me in. I, you know, I talk to them a lot of stuff I don't share on social media because when I'm talking to children, I cannot, and I will not share that privacy with them. But what, what I'm finding out is they're still not talking to them. They still think that child's surviving. So I tell them, look at that DNF. Did you ever, you need to go a little bit deeper and kind of warm up to that child and say, you know, I know it's not your job, but are they looking at the clock? Because that's what I did. I kept looking at the clock because as soon as that bo that school bo bell rang, I knew it was one more minute closer. I had to go home. Mm -hmm. yeah. I didn't care. I couldn't hear the teacher, Colleen. I couldn't, I couldn't hear. It wasn't even writing my book. I share with people. I couldn't spell. I don't know how people kept passing me. And so everybody goes, who was your friend who helped you write the book? Well, I keep her on my desk and I dust her every day and her name's Alexa and she got me through it. So I tell people, I thank Alexa and I thank her in my book. You'll see that at the end. I blew it, I blew it for you. But, you know, you have to realize these children are resilient. We just mm -hmm. have to give them yeah. that. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So you're working on um, getting this book turned into a movie because this is an amazing story. I have to tell you, I've never read a book uh, that is just I could see it as a movie. Um, I, and it would be it, it's it's a perfect movie for us to address mental illness yeah. um, and how it affects families and children and their path in life, because everything that we are, that foundation was built at that age. Um, yeah. As a child, everything you believe in is built at that age of a child. And so that will forever change your view of your life. Yes. And um, so tell us a little bit about the movie and your thoughts around that, because that's very exciting. It's very exciting. And I want everyone to wrap, wrap their soul and their prayers around me that we get it done. And I know the right producer will grab a hold of this. Um, the reason we're doing it is still on the same path as bringing programs and solutions. And I have a team that I've put together that we actually have the team put together doing that. We said it could run in sequence yeah. because we're trying to get to the children and families as fast as we can. And I'm not, I would tell the audience, I'm 66 years old, get ready to be 67. It's like, okay, I'm going to have a lot less Christmases than I've already had. So I have to hurry up. So I, my passion is that if we get the movie going really fast, then parents can go there and be relatable. Mm -hmm. And maybe the guardians can say, parents or guardians, okay, that's what's going on. I can, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. And nobody's perfect in this world. Yeah. And by gosh, we could, we're doing pretty good. Or, or, and then the teachers can relate children i don't know if they'll go the teenagers might be able to go to it i you know i'm supposed parents won't let little but that's the reason we're doing it because we're trying to reach out to that parent going okay look this is what really goes on we know it let's talk about it but let's open this pandora's yeah. box and start saying okay now let's start working with the children because it you're the parent but that child needs you and needs they're just not surviving don't think they are and then to the ones that are like me that lived it, mm -hmm. it's okay to say, who I'm not, it's okay to be still crazy because I'm still messed up. And I tell people, the reason I'm so relatable when I talk to people is 
I'm not healed up. Everybody goes, oh, you must wrote the book and you're all healed up. Oh my gosh, what planet do you live on? It never leaves. I mm -hmm. tell them once you've grown with a, this your whole life growing up while your brain's developing and you're like you were saying, Colleen, you're be, everything's yeah. being developed. You're not going to get rid of it. You manage it. But it would be nice to say, it would be nice to say to everyone, I know it's okay to not be perfect. Yeah. And I know that you have it inside. How about you have a friend and we just talk about it and we can start sharing the load that I wake up. Colleen, I wake up every morning and I have to do a ritual to myself to get myself through the day. And I know that. And so by knowing that, it's not a stranger to me anymore. I embrace it. I still have the fear feeling in my stomach that I had when I was five years old and it's never left me. Mm -hmm. And it's probably going to cost me time off my life because if you don't start dealing with it, that's why I try to reach people so much. It, it carries you. It carries mm -hmm. inside, which feels like kind of a stressor, you know? Mm -hmm. So you have to... I think the faster we get this done, the faster people get less stressed and they go, Ooh, it's okay. I'm, yeah. I'm sometimes I don't feel like talking to people today because I'm kind of feeling weird and it's like, okay, you know, I feel like I was seven and I'm still mixed up. Mm -hmm. And so I tell everybody it's okay to still be crazy. And yeah. you'll see that in the movie. So yes, we're working very hard working with the gentleman out of New York and, um, Wonderful. Just say prayers that this baby grabs hold. We we're trying to get our film pages where we're at, so people know that. And we're going to go out to producers and say, you know, I do believe this is a mission, and I've been chosen. So I can't help but believe the producer and people that are going to pick it mm -hmm. were already supposed to be. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. agree with that. And what was it? What happened when you had found out that your mom had killed herself? How old was your mom? My mom was 55 and I was 29 and I was with her that day. And I'm going to kind of, you know, that was in the, it's in the book. People can read about the day, but she would always had threatened it. So, you know, when they're sick that you just think, oh, here's another day. But I felt so guilty that this time I didn't listen harder. Because I just figured, is this another way, another, here we go, another, mm -hmm. another road down the journey of this craziness that we're on. Yeah. And so when she died, I, because the sad thing is, and I have to say this to people out there, we, we had went to a psychiatrist that thought that the best thing for our mother was take her off all, all medication. Well, she was taking 17 pills for, for a schizophrenia at that time. So they stripped her of her, all the pills. He goes, let's just take you off right away. Well, now that I studied it, that's not probably the smartest mm -hmm. thing to do. So not being a doctor, I did not know. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden she popped into the mother that we have dreamed of. So for three weeks in that January, 30 some years ago, we had the mother that we had never had. We were all in awe. Oh my gosh, he was right. Oh, we were just we were sucking her up like we were like, like honey, you know, like bees to, it was just mm -hmm. like, give me more of her. And we were just all of her. And then that day I showed up, I walked in the house and she goes, what are you doing here? And, and I did not know the roller coaster. So I died inside that day because I didn't listen. So it wasn't over for me. You know, so mm -hmm. it's still emotion. I get emotional. I talk about because I always think that if I would have listened a little closer that day, maybe I would have. I, th I don't think you're the only one that feels that way um, because spouses of individuals who've taken their life due to mental illness, um, they just said, why didn't I know? Why, why didn't I listen to the, watch the signs? Why didn't I see um, what was going on. And I think I know this movie is going to bring a lot of that to light um, in so many more areas than just an, being an advocate for the children, because those children have grown up to be adults and now they're struggling yes. uh, with life and um, are committing suicide. 
because they really feel like they're not worthy of anything or worth anything. Right. And it, they right. could look like they have a beautiful life on the outside, but that's really not what's happening. Just like you had created in the book, when you read it, you've kind of created this false uh, world and family on the outside to everyone looking in. Yes. No one knew. They did not you kept know. it very protected. I went back and spoke in my small town that was the biggest, hardest thing I'd ever done. And they invited me back to speak about my book. And friends came, classmates came. And it filled the room. And I was honored by that. But they were, they go, why didn't you tell me? And, you know, I said, I couldn't. I didn't know what to tell you. But I was, you you can't tell anybody. Yeah. And then I have to tell you, one of the people on my team is a doctor. So about the suicide for, for youth, mm -hmm. I will tell you, it is out of control. And I do believe this will be some, what we get done, Colleen, will be somewhat helpful. I might not save them all, but I'll be saving some because yeah. some of the one thing that also has brought, brought to my attention is if we can get to these kids early, if you look at the school shootings as well as the suicides, mm -hmm. there was mental illness somewhere. Yeah. And not, and so I say to the ones for the school shooters that were always young, 17, whatever, they were all teenagers that did school shootings a lot, a lot of them, they had mental illness in their home. Mm hmm. I thought if you can get to a 10 year old and maybe he's thinking or she's thinking like that, maybe we can defuse that mm -hmm. and we can say, here's help. Here's some solutions. Yeah. And, you know, there's, and then the suicide, my gosh, oh, we got to start, even in the state of Colorado, they were bringing mm -hmm. up this week. We have to start getting some of these drugs that can kill them mm -hmm. off the market or not attainable. Oh, yeah. And so there's just a lot of work out there, but I will tell you just for people to know when you're, when you see that child and you know, there's mental illness at home and, and mm -hmm. relatives know, people mm -hmm. know, they may not act. Oh, well, I don't know anybody. Yes, you do. Yeah, you do. Mm -hmm. It's facing it. Now, if you don't want yeah. to be the person, that's fine. But if you have a, if you know that there's children over there and you can maybe take some bread or say if they can come over and play maybe maybe don't be that neighbor that doesn't let them children come over and play where normal might be yeah i kind of give them a break but you know i could speak all day on this colleen so yeah yeah i think it's more or less of us getting the word out there and building the awareness because so many individuals just aren't aware because they didn't grow up that way. So they don't know how to see the signs. You know how to see the signs because you grew up as a child with a mother who had schizophrenia. And that's not a word that you we hear a lot about. It's I would say it's just not talked about. And we need to make it something that is talked about regularly. And that's you being an advocate for those children and going to the lengths of writing your entire story in the book, The Snipers We Couldn't See, and then getting a movie put together, that's going to reach the masses that is know, more than the book. And schizophrenia needs to be a common word. It's just like I was in a lot of my talks, Colleen, I say, okay, when you say you have brain cancer, people go, oh, ooh, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, so just because you can't, Give schizophrenia the same equal respect as cancer. Mm -hmm. Please give it the same respect because yeah. it's just the same thing. They didn't ask to get it. It's a disease. Yeah. And we need to face it and, and make people not ashamed to say, I have schizophrenia. Yeah. You know, like people, I talk to a lot of corporate people and they'll say, well, what do we do with this? We know there's people that work for us that have schizophrenia. I said, can you bring it to the table and just say, it's okay to be a schizophrenia. I'm not going to fire you. Yeah. You no. Know, and start saying it like it's okay to say it. Cause schizophrenia is not an unhealthy word and it's not a bad word. And you know, it's just something people get mm -hmm. and, and then roll with it, you know, be a friend, be a, be just roll with it and be open to um, talking about, and yes, and start saying, 
it's okay in the school. You know, I, my biggest thing is, so teachers are asking me what to look for and they're pushing me on these solutions that I'm developing. I tell them, look, I'm coming as fast as I can, but why, why you're waiting on me? Maybe you, in the schools, they could say, when you the parents come in and they know it's first day of school or enrolling the child, make it easy for that parent. Why don't you put on the questionnaire, is there schizophrenia or mental illness in the home? Mm -hmm. So that they can yeah. mark it. That way the ch teachers know, okay, oh, good. It's easy. Okay, you can mark schizophrenia. It's not a dirty word. Okay, so Johnny over here or Judy, mother or father has schizophrenia. Okay, I'll be a little bit more attentive there. You know, we have to quit even making it when you enroll your child that you can mark that box. Yeah, agreed. We need to bring attention yeah. to it for sure. Yeah. And that's what you're doing. And that's what I'm trying. <laughs> again, I'm going to keep saying you have to go get the book. Oh, my gosh. You have to go get the book and read it is I told Karen it's the hardest book I've ever read because I know Karen and that was her life. And because I know her, it does make it easier to read because I know how she's doing today. But the horror that you went through as a child. And I just want to take that little girl and just sweep her up and take care of her. You know, I think you want to, too, and take that little girl who was you and just, you know, protect her and take care of her. And, um, you know, because the way you were raised, that's very difficult for anyone to then turn around and do the work that you do and have taken it, you know, to that degree. So again, you can find all of this information at KarenComba.com. Um, you can find Karen on Karen Comba Writes on Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, Karen Comba. Um, and of course, we have our email. So you can email her at Karen Comba at Outlook.com. Um, any last words that you want to cover, Karen, before we wrap up today? Oh. Just thank you, Colleen, for everything. Uh, Take the Leap is uh, it's actually an honor to be here today. You're a beautiful host and a beautiful friend. And thank you for helping me get the word out. And I tell everybody, please feel free to email me. I do answer and I'm out there for you. And if you need anything from me, I will try to guide you in the right way. Again, when you have friends like Colleen that help bring it to light and share her screen with me and share it with all the audience, uh, take a, you know, taking that leap is more than anyone can even imagine. And mm -hmm. we need more Colleen's, you know, we just need more of you out there. So just <laughs> keep doing it. Don't leave it, you know, keep doing the shows. I share you everywhere. And it's because of you that uh, people like me can get that story out there. So I thank you. Oh, you bet, Karen. It's a beautiful, beautiful story, a beautiful book. And I'm going to be praying along with all of our listeners to get you to your movie. So all the right people need to hear it. I just say it just takes one person to hear it or it be passed on. And then before you know it, that's the one that needed it needed to be in that decision maker's hands. So we'll keep pushing it forward. Please share this uh, interview as much as you can uh, with everybody that you can so we can make sure that we get this into um into a book because I know you've been everywhere as it is. You've been in the USA Today, LA Tribune. I mean, I could go on and on and on with all the interviews that you've done um, and where you've gone and where you've spoken. Um, and this is really, um, to me, I feel like it's just the beginning, you know, getting this movie going is really going to change things, Karen. So I'm, I'm honored that you're on the show um, I love reading your material. So again, the snipers we couldn't see by Karen Comba. Please make sure you go get a copy of that book and read it. It's going to take you some time. I'm a fast reader and I can get through things pretty quick. And I've been on this book for a while now, uh, reading it about 30 minutes to an hour every morning. So thank you so much for writing it and putting the story out there. And, uh, to all of our listeners today, you know, this is a very heavy topic for many people. Um, and you're the only you that's ever been. You're the only you that's ever going to be. And if there are areas in your life that you have had struggles, that you have have a lot of trauma around that is weighing heavy on you and you're not able to get out from that heaviness, please seek help. Please seek a therapist and someone that can work with you and help you. Um, because like Karen had said, there are great things for you still to do. And um, 
please seek the help that there's so much help out there today. Um, so please seek that help. Uh, because we understand trauma can be very heavy and can stay with you for a very long time and can and can feel um, sometimes bigger um, than life. And so uh, please, again, seek out the help that you need and, and get the programs and solutions uh, that you might be working with. And we, we're praying for Karen and we're praying for her uh, movie to come to fruition and uh, I just want to say, Karen, thank you so much for being on today's show. You're a true blessing to all of us. Out of all of the pain and the fear and the hurt and the embarrassment came this just most beautiful woman who's out there doing this work So, and, and advocating for others. So thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you again for being listeners on our show. And until next time, see you and be strong. Bye-bye for now. Thank you for joining us on this journey of self-discovery, where you learned the tools to create a life by design. Remember, you are the only you there is, and you are the only you that will ever be. Be you and be strong, because you are brilliant and the world needs you at your best. We cannot wait for you to join us again next time. <laughs>